Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, let, let me say a few words before we get started. This is, some of you may have come to the last jobs workshop um, I did. Uh, this one I've never done before. I covered some of this. It, that was a very broad, broad jobs workshop about all aspects of the job search. This is just focused on your written package that you would send in for a job. It's t appropriately timed because those of you who are applying for jobs that are on the academic calendar are preparing those now. Job applications are due in the, you know, starting as early as October and through December. Um, anyway, this is a little bit of an experiment because we've never done this before and I'm co-teaching this with Supraja. Uh, and so I ask you to, you know, to be very interactive and welcome your feedback so that we can tailor this in the future. Um, what's not, what we won't present today but sounds like a really great idea is to have a kind of workshop where there's peer review and you actually come with your writing and uh, get feedback in real time on research statements and teaching statements and all of that. So this will be kind of a broad brushstrokes of what the different components are, how you should approach them, good writing practices, uh, and later we can think of ways to be more interactive with respect to peer review and things like that. And with that, I want Supraja to introduce herself and why she's here co-teaching with me. Hi everyone, I'm Supraja, I work in Albani's group. Uh, I'm not secretly a professor. The reason I'm here <laughs> is because I'm a fellow at the Graduate Writing Lab at Yale. I don't know if people are familiar with this. Uh, it's a really cool uh, place. They offer two different kinds of services, all free. One of them, uh, we teach workshops on various aspects of writing. So this could be how to organize a cover letter, for instance, how to organize your thoughts, make maybe a mind map, and, and get it into linear form. But it also could be about the writing process, time management, how to deal with imposter syndrome when you're writing a job application, for instance, uh, things like this. And then we also do one-on-one -on -one consultations where you meet with a peer who's trained to look over writing or to brainstorm ideas with you. It's very low pressure. Uh, there are science consultants and humanities and social sciences consultants. Uh, I'm, for instance, a science writing consultant, so is Tyler over here. He works at the writing lab, too. Uh, and it's really a nice resource for us because it's also nice sometimes to get a third person to look at your writing who has no stakes in your job application process um, and give you some good feedback. So that's why I'm here. I'll talk a little bit about writing today. And since this is a jobs workshop in general, I'll point out a mistake that both Supraja and I made, although she did better than I did. My name is Bonnie Fleming, first name, last name. I'm a professor of physics here at Yale, and this is Supraja Balasubramanian. Um, so always important when in any part of the job process, and frankly, for anyone you meet, first name and your last name, and a little blurb about what you do. Great. <laughs> and I got your last name right. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. There's lots of resources. Supraja mentioned a few of these, uh, the Writing Center in particular. Um, there's also lots of resources online. You can find um, everything you need to know on the internet. Be careful. And here are some things that Supraja put together that are specific things that are helpful for the job search. Today's plan, um, we said a few words about this already. The idea is just to go over, remind you about basics of the job search, the time scales, when you should be doing what, when you should be thinking about the next step. Um, probably in December or something, if people are interested, we can do an entire talk on how to give a job talk, which is a really critical component of a job search. Um, then we'll talk about the different components of your written package. Uh, and what are highlights of good things to things you must include, good things to include, et cetera. And finally, talk about effective writing, um, which is, uh, you know, Supraja is the expert as a fellow at the Writing Center and Tyler as well. Um, how to organize your writing, how to get your purpose across, general guidelines and tricks for good writing. Do you want to add anything about that? Okay. So I showed this at like the third slide of my last jobs workshop. Most important thing really in life, and certainly for looking for a job, is to be proactive. You are your own best advocate. Uh, your advisor is there to help you. Your peers are there to help you. Your mentors, 
um, both your colleagues and your advisors, mentor up, down, and sideways. But you are success for you depends on you being proactive. So all of you are here. That's a good sign. Okay. So how the process works, and this is focused, and this whole workshop is really focused on the university US job system. I'm sure there are things that are relevant for job searches in general and for European faculty jobs, but at least the components that I'll talk about today are best suited um, and are targeted towards mm -hmm. US university faculty positions. Um, so here's some here's the general timeline for how faculty jobs work. They work on the academic calendar. Ads go out in early fall, which is about now. In the physics program, we're just getting the first ads out. They go out in many different venues. They go out to Physics Today, which has a little bit of a limited readership sometimes, often to inspire, um, often through word of mouth and collaboration lists or other lists that are field specific. Uh, like I'm involved in the quantum search. There's a couple quantum email lists, for example, that kind of jo uh, job ad goes out to. And the applications are typically due as early as, say, October 15th, and they can trickle into December. I feel like the academic calendar gets earlier and earlier every year because universities try to t get an edge by getting applications in, starting the process as early as possible so they can have the first offers out. So, um, Keep that in mind to give yourself the time you need to put together all these different written materials for these. Um, you, there can be a couple of hundred replies for any given faculty position. You know that it's a competitive market. Um, so a lot of the things that you do in the first view that people get of you, which is in the written portfolio, are really important. Committees are typically from uh, a broad range within any department here. Uh, for example, for a field in particle physics, let's say it's a neutrino position, which is what I do. There's typically at Yale and probably not dissimilar to other institutions, the chair of the committee is someone who's a little bit outside of that field. Um, so for example, I mentioned the quantum search. I'm the chair of that committee, but I am not a quantum person. Um, although there are people who are deep in the field on the committee, the point of mentioning this is for all of your materials, for your interview, for everything, you're speaking, you can be speaking to people who are physicists but not in your subfield. And you should pay attention to that when you're describing what you do and avoiding using jargon and that kind of thing. Uh, typically, four to six candidates are interviewed that can be larger than that. Uh, the interviews are typically in January or February and offers out as soon as possible after that and they trickle into March. Um, in all fields, in many fields, there are rumor mills. In um, it, particle physics, this is the faculty rumor mill page. I was looking on it this morning and I realized there's also a postdoc rumor mill page. So if there is a rumor mill page in your area, it's useful to look at it. It's also useful, you can choose to have your name on it or not. Typically there's a place where you can email the person who runs the rumor mill page. Um, if you're applying for many jobs, having your name on that page is a great thing because uh, some, someone who's looking for faculty jobs will look at that and say, huh, so-and-so is on five shortlists. Why are we not interviewing them? Uh, so it's a good idea to pay attention to them for what jobs are available and to put your name on them uh, if you're comfortable doing so and um, to get your name out there if you're on a short list. Questions? Yes. Why would they have the chair of the committee be someone not from the field? I mean, clearly it sounds like it's by design. I'm just wondering um, what the purpose of that is in general. Right. So, um, is anyone for, can can it, is the, I assume the the camera can hear the questions, but maybe I'll just repeat it just in case. The question was, um, why is it, for example, at Yale, is the chair of the committee someone who's not directly in the field? And here we do it because you want to make sure that the, our searches, we try to be broad. Uh, we don't, we, that's a relatively recent thing, let's say in the last 15 years. We don't like hiring people who are, you know, someone who's going to join a group and is sort of a glorified postdoc, which was the old Yale. Um, and so for, for me, having a chair as an outside person, make sure that you're doing due diligence and having a broad search and finding the best person. Um, 
there may be other reasons. Um, it, that's, a, that's a good practice for actually doing the search and in terms of optics of trying to find the best person and showing that you're trying to be diverse and find the best person, that's another reason. I don't know that all universities do that. But all I will say that I would guess that all universities have committee members who are not in that specific field. So it still goes the, the, the same thing I would say, as I said before, for these um, packages, make sure you speak to a broad physics audience and that you avoid jargon. Other questions? Okay. Tips on applications. Um, I'm still not to the writing package part, but uh, you know, I showed this at the last workshop, apply broadly. Um, there's a good rule of thumb. If you're absolutely sure you wouldn't go somewhere, you may not want to apply to them because if that's the only offer you get, you'll be in a bit of a quandary. Uh, consider if it's a good fit for you. Positions are different. Some positions are, uh, let's say on a, if you're on a collider experiment, you're gonna join a group that already has two Atlas people there and so you'll, be want, you'll wanna be able to work with those people. Uh, or you might want to go to an institution where you're starting a new group and you can enact your vision. There's very different ways that you can fit into a faculty. Ask around, ask the same question to many different people. You'll get different opinions and that's always useful. And give yourself time. I'll say this again, it takes time to, and it's it takes mental energy to apply for jobs. and. Uh, put together a package and go on interviews and prepare for a job talk and just the background stress and mental energy. So, you know, if you're also writing your dissertation at the same time, remember that's a lot to do at once. Give yourself time, okay? Questions? Okay, let's get on to the point of this workshop, which is putting together your package. And here's the components that you're typically asked for in a package. You may or may not get asked for a cover letter, but you should provide one. Uh, you will always get asked for a research statement. Uh, we'll talk about all these components in detail, by the way. Research statements should be about three pages and not a lot longer. Teaching statement should be about one page. Diversity statement should be about one page. I write sometimes there because it's a pretty new thing. I would say this year is the first year that we at Yale are asking for a diversity statement. We ask for one for the graduate students, so you filled one in in your application to come here, I think. Um, but we're starting to ask for them at the faculty level too. So um, how to write them is a relatively new thing, but we can talk about it. CV, as many pages as you need, but there is a way, even if your CV is five pages or 20 pages, to highlight the most important things, which we'll talk about. Um, Overall, and I'll say this a couple times, these are different pieces and, and there's different components that go into each piece and it's good to emphasize some of the same things across the different components, but you should try not to be overly redundant. I get irritated if I see a research, super irritated if I see a research statement and then a blurb in the CV and it's like the same text. Why do I have to read the same thing twice? So it can be useful to highlight key things, but you should avoid being too redundant. Because someone will take your whole package and flip through the thing as a whole. They're not gonna look at each candidate's research statement and then each candidate's CV. They're gonna look at your whole package all at once. Bonnie, yes. Can we discuss uh, very quickly which of these would go into a postdoc application typically? Yes, that's a good point. Postdoc applications can vary. For the fancy postdoc applications, meaning the fellowships, like the Chamberlain Fellow uh, at Berkeley or the Enrico Fermi Fellow at Chicago, there's different ones in different areas. They tend to work on the academic calendar and they tend to require many of the same components, maybe all of the same components. For other postdocs that are advertised through uh, to work in a group in an institution, the postdoc application can vary broadly. Someone may not even ask you for a research statement. Maybe they know you and they say, just come give a talk and um, you know, let's see how it goes. Or they may say, I don't care if you give a talk, I know you're great, I wanna hire you, when can you start? So it really, postdoc applications really vary. Um, the, again, the most detailed will be just like a faculty search. And in theory, uh, any theorists here? 
couple, yes. In theory, I believe all of the, almost all of the postdoc uh, applications go on the academic calendar just like faculty jobs. An experiment, again, it's only for the fancy fellowships. Some people try to line up a postdoc search with the fancy, with the academic calendar so they can see the same people who are applying for the named fellowships. And some people just open a search at any given time. Good? Questions? Great. Okay, cover letter. Let's start with cover letter. This is the first thing that uh, is on the top of your package. But something, for example, that I personally breeze right through. So shouldn't be too long. You might irritate someone, um, but should definitely highlight um, the critical things that someone should look for in the rest of the application. Okay, so you should be enthusiastic about the position you're applying for. Uh, if there's, um, you know, parts in your CV, a specific leadership position you held an analysis which is now published in PRL, those are things you can highlight in the CV, but maybe not go into details of, for example, what the analysis is or what it means to be such and such convener on your experiment or that kind of thing. Um, you should, in the process of this, be explaining why you're the best candidate and at all levels demonstrate that you're a good writer. Good writing is a great thing, great skill to have. If you feel like you need to work on that skill, I am sure there are resources at the Writing Center to help you. Okay, a few more things about cover letter. Um, how do you address it? If possible, your cover letter should be on stationery, Yale University stationery. Um, you should uh, write it to the chair of the committee if the chair of the committee is listed in the ad. Sometimes the department chair is listed as a contact in the ad and you can write it to the department chair. If there's no listing, you can say Dear Search Committee, but you should write it, um, uh, you should address it to, the, to that in that way. Less than a page, opportunity to hit high points. Uh, we mentioned this on the last slide. Um, and you can include relevant information for that institution. There, so things, things have become a little more generic, like faculty can submit a generic reference letter um, to say AJO that can go to many jobs. Um, you should try to be a, a, as specific as you can because it shows how interested you are in that institution and in that position. So if there's something relevant for this job that relates to you, I know you already have an Atlas group. I'm really excited to be able, with the possibility of joining that group, you should do that. Or I'm in this specific branch of theory. I know you have a very broad theory group and that Dynamic is something that I, I, I think is great and look forward to being a, possibly being a part of. Okay? Do you want to add anything? Um, the organization of the cover letter, really, I would say this is a general, uh, I want to pause and say this is general organization for like every component of a job search. Introduction, body, conclusion. That's true in a cover letter, that's true in a research statement, that's true in a teaching statement, that's true in a diversity statement, that's true in a talk. You should tell the people what you want to tell them and what their takeaway should be. Then you should give them all the information that backs that up and then you should remind them again. And if we do something more specific to job talk, I'll talk about that again. Like in a job talk, people can, you know, get, it'll be until slide 20 before you actually know what they do. In all of these cases, talk, and in all of these written materials, you should start with what you want them to take away. Uh, and it doesn't have to be long. It shouldn't be long. Um, I'm the best person for this position because of blah, 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 blah. Then all the details, and then remind them at the end. It sounds a little pedantic, but people are reading through many applications, and you want them to remember exactly. You want, them to, you want to tell them what you want them to remember. Jump in anytime. Okay. Format, I said some of these. Use letterhead, use proper letter etiquette, use formal titles, 12 point font, Times New Roman, one inch margins. And um, I, I think for all of these things, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, maybe if we do a peer review, you know, writing examples workshop that's more focused when you guys have materials in front of you, the other thing to provide before that would be examples. I don't have them today. Um, any first-year grad students in the room? 
one. So there was a 515 class for the first year graduate students. All of you took 515, or many of you did, um, where um, Professor Sweeney uh, was teaching how to write, uh, uh, for example, an NSF graduate research fellowship. And through that process, you saw grad physics graduate students saw from me an email that said, please, if you won a fellowship or if you were nominated, like in the final running for a fellowship uh, of any sort, and you're willing to share your successful statements, please send them in. And the point is to have a kind of repository, which we can also do for research statements. We have to ping some people who've left already, but I think we can do that. And that's a great way to be able to look at someone's successful research statement and see uh, all of these uh, as implemented in each of these different components. So um, I, I, that, that would be the goal for a future workshop to provide that kind of thing. CV, same thing. I thought about bringing some of my own materials, but my CV is terrible looking. It's got all the right components, but it's, it's, it, it's very visually very boring. And some people have awesome CVs. Not, and, and there's sort of a different style for academic positions than I think you might write for like a data science position. And we can even collect them in those categories so you guys have an idea of um, good examples. Comments, questions? Good? OK. OK, let's talk about the research statement. I think this is the most important part of the package for research institutions. Um, a research institution like Yale, you have to be both a researcher and a teacher, but research is really important. And so um, how you present yourself and how you present your expertise and your vision going forward in this statement, I think, is very important. Uh, it's a scientific document. I note it's not why you are a scientist. So it's not like when I was a kid, an apple fell on my head, and I realized how much I loved physics. That is a research statement I would get really sick of really quickly. It's what you've done as a scientist. You're all scientists. Your scientific accomplishments and how that plays into your vision going forward for, for that job, Okay, what you're going to bring to that institution. You should put the physics first. Um, many, particularly for experimentalists, you may have done a combination of physics and hardware. And the hardware may be something you really love to do, or software if you're a data scientist and you um, really developed a machine learning technique which has been transformative. Those are all fine, but those are tools for the physics. And you should put the physics first, what the physics results are. Those other things are really important and um, impactful, but put the physics first. Um, you should include both all these other things that I mentioned, hardware experience, software experience, um, throughout and try to tie them all together. It's really hard to talk about a successful research statement without looking at one, so we'll have to do that, like I said, at some later point. Because you want to mention all these things and you want to weave them together into a story uh, that shows how your experience in physics and in software and in hardware and your leadership roles uh, in a variety of different things weave into your vision for what you're going to bring to that institution, okay? And you should be as specific as possible. It, 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 you have to be artful how you write in what your leadership roles are, because you don't want to, you'll list them on your CV, but you don't want to, um, sometimes the way you can write it in a way that makes you feel like you're showing off or something, but there's very clever ways to um, to, to show people how you were a leader. In my role as cross-section convener on Microboon, I led three physics analyses that led to publications in physical review letters, something like that. You haven't said, I am the physics convener, but you've weaved it into the outcome, which is an artful way to do that. Um, I'll just mention here another very artful way in talks to show your leadership is to put pictures in with you in the picture and a little arrow, me filling the cryostat with liquid argon. You know what I mean? Um, that can be a very subtle way to show your roles in things. <laughs> okay, questions, comments? Okay, I'm going to pause when we get to the end of research statement, but there's two more slides. So again, same thing I talked about in cover letter, introduction, body, conclusion. Introduction, what your research vision is for this position, why your previous experience makes you uniquely suited for that vision, and why this is a great fit for that position. And that should be like a short paragraph. 
And that should be what catches them to really focus on the rest of the research statement, the body. How all of that past experience um, is really great. And, how, and your support hardware and software experience feeds into that analysis physics and how that translates to your vision in the future, okay? And then conclusion, like you did in the introduction, remind them of your vision and your expertise and your fit for this position and your ability to execute it. Okay. And here's another reminder, the committee will be broad. So while you want to mention specifics, um, at the same time, you know, avoid jargon or define jargon and mention the specifics in a way that someone who's, if you're applying for an experimental position, a condensed matter theorist can understand it or the other way around. Okay? Okay. Well, yeah. How do you uh, balance between your experience as what you did and what you want to do as a faculty or a postdoc? Because when I was applying for postdoc, I focus much more on what I did because what I am going to do as a postdoc was kind of much more set and probably what your boss tells you to do. Yes. But as a faculty, uh, you kind of have more freedom to do what you are going to do. And I feel like you have to emphasize much more on what you want to do as a faculty based on your experience as a postdoc. Yep. So as a postdoc, you're right. You're often working for someone, and you should know what they're doing and how you fit into their group. Um, some postdocs, some of the named postdocs, have more freedom than that. They may even come with some amount of research money. And in that case, you should inject some of your own vision, but show how it's aligned with, what the, who, with whomever you're going to be working for works on. And then with faculty positions, yes, it's a different thing. You have to show them your vision, uh, whether and it depends on the position. If it's uh, joining an existing collider group, that's a vision that you may be complementary and build on what they did and expand in a new area. Um, if you're starting a new group, they want to see that you have a vision to be able to do that. You know, from the perspective of the faculty who's trying to hire you, they want someone who's going to come in win a whole bunch of early career awards, start a new group that attracts students and postdocs, and become do great physics and become well known for it. Get students, get money, get famous, gives you tenure, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and how would you write a winning uh, NSF career award proposal? Having a vision for what you're going to do, and that vision should fit with, it should be back, you should be able to execute it based on the experience that you have. Um, uh, but it could be switching subfields slightly, and that's okay, as long as the story fits that your expertise can head you in that direction. Um, and um, it, should, uh, it should fit within um, the rest of that specific department for, for uh, like, you don't want to say, I'm going to go and do what this other faculty member is doing. You, you want to say that what you're going to do is going to add and make that department more excellent. Okay, yes. So uh, then should people think uh, ahead of on what the funding agencies are also uh, thinking for the future to be kind of, do we, do we need to include that in research statements? For so I don't know that I would include it in a research statement. Um, you know, and I don't even know that I would include a statement like I intend to apply for the NSF and the right, DOE right, right. early career awards or something mm -hmm. like that. That's something that you would transmit in an interview and you mm -hmm. should. And you can do it in a clever way. How is, how is this group funded? Of course, I intend to apply and win all of the early career awards, but you know, I'm talking to you about, are you a DOE institution or an mm -hmm. NSF institution, something like right. that. But I, I was thinking more in terms of the agenda of the funding agencies, like their, their own vision and how your research can be aligned with that. Yeah, that makes a difference. It can make a difference. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say that uh, anybody who's looking at job applications only wants to hire something that the funding agencies are going to okay. fund, okay. but they also don't want someone who's clearly working on something that is not in the vision for the field. So each field has a vision, a mm -hmm. uh, strategic plan, and if, let's say, you're working in my field in neutrino physics and you want to work on Dune, it's, it's, it, it certainly 
you know, to say Dune, the vision for the flagship experiment in part US-based particle physics is what I want to work on. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a an easy statement that where anyone like a condensed matter theorist reading the application will say, oh, okay, well, that must be in line with the vision. Mm -hmm. And if they have any question about it, they're going to go and ask their colleagues on the same committee. It, it looks like that's aligned with the vision, and so that would be well-funded, mm -hmm. and the answer would be yes. Um, or if it's a quantum initiative, you might say, I know there's, you know, there's, I'm going into this field because it's fantastic science, it's on the frontiers of new research, and it's a big new initiative at many institutions and the community broadly speaking. And that's code for the DOE has a lot of money they're throwing into quantum <laughs> science. <laughs> right. Good. Does that answer your question? Good. Okay. Um, so the, I mentioned before how in all of these documents, finding ways to mention your leadership roles is important. My example about cross-section and convener. Uh, it's also important to mention awards and prizes. They'll be listed on your CV, but your CV is long. So it's a place where you can say, uh, I went to this conference and um, uh, focusing the culmination of my research and one as a, you know, just as one as a consequence, the best talk prize at the conference. You can mention that here uh, or other awards. It, it, you want to mention it in a way that, that weaves into the story, but so that they uh, can see that it highlights uh, again in this as it's listed in your CV that you want a certain award or something like that. I mentioned what you'll bring it to an institution as a faculty member. That's part of the vision we were talking about how you will tie into that program. That's part of the vision. And you should use citations, and particularly your own. This is another way to highlight something. I just read a research statement this morning from some uh, from a postdoc on Microboon who mentioned um, the different uh, physics uh, analyses that uh, this person mentored of students on the experiment. And all three of those resulted in papers. And I said, you should cite the papers right there. Uh, citations don't count in your three, my suggested three pages. They can leak onto the fourth. And I wouldn't say have 100 citations, but in particular, if you want to highlight the things that you were involved in, you should cite them. Uh, even more so if it's something, if you're on a big experiment and it's something like a public note uh, or even an internal note, which they may not be able to access, but you did write up, uh, this is a place where you can cite it. Uh, and we'll get back to active word choice later. Supraja has uh, a lot of uh, nice comments on how you actually write. Uh, and one key thing is active word choice and, uh, you know, uh, and the example is, uh, and sort of how you put yourself in context. So I led this effort, not I was part of the team that brought this out. Those are, they, you may have done the same thing. They may both be true, but what you want to say is I led this effort. Okay, great. Okay, that's it for research statements. So let me pause and let's talk a little bit more. Any other questions about research statements? Or Supraja, do you want to add anything about research statements? Um, I can bring it up when we go to the writing session. Okay. okay. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, let's say you are now in the search committee. Uh, when you're reading people's applications, uh, do you read the entire package or sometimes just by the cover letter say no? No. I um, so do I read the entire package or at some point do I yeah, dismiss it? Out, yeah. I try to read the entire package, but maybe a better way to ask it is when do my eyes glaze over? Mm -hmm. uh, if the research statement um, is too detailed and I simply can't understand it, let's say I'm the outside person, mm -hmm. my eyes might glaze over. Mm -hmm. um, if the research statement is written in a way that I, I, I only shows past experiences and not the future, I might glaze over it. Mm -hmm. And that would make me probably breeze through the CV, which would not be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I often don't pay a lot of attention, personally don't pay a lot of attention to the cover letter. Uh, okay. It's a lot, the meat of your application is in the research statement oh, for a research institution. For an institution that focuses more on teaching, we'll talk about the teaching statement in a second, mm -hmm. that may also be very critical. For a research in institution, the teaching statement is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So it's important and I look for it. Diversity statements is a brand new thing. I think I will look for them, um, look at them, 
but the research statement is the really critical thing because success as a faculty member at a research institution means having a research program that's fundable that attracts students you know that you're you're this is someone who you'll want to collaborate with and be excited by for what did I say last time? When you join a faculty, it's like a marriage, potentially 40 years. So that kind of thing is important. <laughs> yes? This is um, maybe an amorphous question, but I'm, I feel like what I'm getting from this is that this research statement has to thread a very tough needle of both demonstrating that you have this depth of knowledge in your proposed field and sort of telling a story about like your vision for where this field should go next and how you are integral to that vision for this institution, but also to make it um, you know, uh, approachable enough that a faculty member who's not a specialist in this field will be able to be brought along for that whole story. So, I mean, if it was something like my case, it would it's somehow being able to say like, the Higgs boson is part of the standard model and demonstrating some of that background and then also jumping to the future of this field in a very specific way. Um, yes. So I'm sort of wondering if that's the right thing to be taking away from this and also how. <laughs> yes, that's the right thing to be taking away from it. It is threading the needle. Yeah. Um, but I think you, but you could, and, and so you should be, you should spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> uh, you can put in, you know, hooks, meaning you might say the future in Higgs physics is this kind of analysis that someone who's outside of the field may not completely understand, but someone who's in the field will say, yes, and I want to hear more about that and remi remember to ask you more about it on an interview. So you can kind of put hooks in. It's, it's actually, it's just like in a seminar when you show enough detail um, in the beginning to bring people along and then you may get more detailed in the middle where the experts are paying attention and then you bring people back at the end. It's the same kind of thing here. You, you know, okay. At the same time, threading the needle, for example, you, you don't want to be too pedantic. You don't want to say the standard model is a well, you know, for X many years and blah, 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 you know, started with the eightfold way. You don't want to do that kind of stuff either. So yeah, it's a balance. And getting people to read your research statement and hear what they think, even somebody outside of the field, is a good idea. If you all put together your mentoring maps from the last workshop we had, you have those outside of the field experts that can read your research statement. OK, let's go on to teaching statement. One slide on teaching statement that's not to diminish its importance, in particular if you're um, applying to institutions that are more teaching oriented. What do I mean by more teaching oriented? Some institutions, all institutions value teaching. Some, um, uh, you may have a bigger teaching load or it's, uh, um, uh, or in particular if it's a four-year institution, then you'll probably be teaching more and teaching is very important, okay? So you have to tailor it for the institution. Here I write, what is a teaching statement? A teaching philosophy is a self-reflective statement of your beliefs about teaching and learning. It should also discuss how you put your beliefs into practice by including concrete examples of what you have done or what you anticipate doing in the classroom. So you can describe your teaching philosophy. Is it very hands-on? Do you think people need a foundation and then they uh, take a very detailed foundation and um, move into any subject? Do you think people, it's important to have a, a graduate student have a, a broad basis of many different fields and you appreciated that as a student because you went to many seminars? Describe your teaching experiences, teaching in lab, mentoring students. Mentorship of students is really important. I always like it when if you've mentored a student, you mention them by name. It just makes it more real. They may not know the person, but it makes it more real. Um, you should you can include your outreach experience. I'll say a few more words about this in a second. If you know there are things you'd like to teach, you should say it. Um, what I always um, what what so little things that I notice if someone says I love to teach, I want to teach a class in you know advanced atomic physics that relates to the hottest topics in my field, and that's all they say. That's not very broad because institutions do need people who are going to teach introductory physics to non-science majors or to pre-meds, okay? So you should say what you'd like. You shouldn't 
you know, say something just because you think it will be a winning strategy, but it is noticed uh, mm -hmm. when people read teaching statements, if people are can be diverse in their teaching. I like to teach labs. I also like to te teach introductory courses, and I'd love to teach a specific course in my area or even create a new course um, you know, that combines two different disciplines or something like that, okay? Outreach experience, it's good to mention outreach ex experience. Things are changing, but I used to tell women not to highlight your outreach too much. There has been a bias in the past that for women in particular, somehow they look soft uh, if they do a lot of outreach because I guess people assume that therefore they're not doing research, which is not necessarily true. Um, but you have to you have to be careful about that. I think it's still true in my CV. I don't list my outreach. I say I have a heading for it, and I say you can go to this web page if you want to see it. Um, that's a little depressing, but that's a reality. So uh, by contrast, uh, I think if men do outreach, it um, seems really great. <laughs> so you should highlight it. Um, that's that's just that's how it is. I don't know what else to say about that. I feel <laughs> awkward now, but anyway. Um, any questions or comments? Okay, I think these are hard to write and even hard to read because they're a little amorphous. Uh, so this will be an example where if we can get some examples of successful teaching statements, because I don't like when I when they get a little too uh, whimsical. Um, I like when they're fact-based, just like I said about a research statement. What you've done, what you appreciate, Different, what does it mean to have a teaching philosophy? I don't really know, that's kind of hard. Hands-on teaching, new teaching techniques, that really resonates with institutions that are thinking about mm -hmm. new ways to do teaching, flipped classrooms. Can resonate, cannot resonate. I taught a flipped class once and it was kind of a disaster. So now I don't know what to say when people talk about it, except it seems like a good idea, but the students hated it. Um, so uh, I, you, you have to, this is, a little bit of a thread the needle to Mario. Okay. On to diversity statements, even harder. I don't have a lot of words here because these are brand new. I Googled it, and this was the best definition I got for it. It's a personal essay that's a depiction of your past experiences and explains how these experiences contributed to your personal and professional growth. Um, and it allows the search committee to see the qualities and commitment that you bring to the table. And different institutions and different people within different institutions, I think, will read these statements in different ways. Um, so I don't have a lot of advice on these. It's a little bit new territory. Um, if you have a diversity experience that um, in some way defines uh, in, a, in a positive way how you are a scientist, I think that would be a great thing to put here. If you... Um, feel like, uh, you know, if you uh, like the idea that diversity means excellence, this that's a more standard concept of diversity, this is a great place to write that. Um, that's the kind of thing. I don't have too much to say about this because it's only been um, last year one of our searches required a diversity statement. This year uh, all of our searches are requiring a diversity statement, so it's kind of new territory. You guys should know more than me what to write in a diversity statement because you're younger. Okay. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I mean, if you really can't, if it's required, and I assume if you can't, if you don't have any direct personal experiences, I've seen diversity statements where people talk about sort of why they care about diversity, which everyone should, uh, and then you know weave that into their experience and then talk about the science if this makes sense it's not something that's happened to you necessarily but you can still show your commitment to diversity especially for a faculty position i think that helps to show that you care and you're planning to you could even have a plan for how you want to mm -hmm. engage with this yeah it's safe to say if an institution asks for a diversity statement they're kind of a pro diversity institution <laughs> <laughs> You yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, like Surprise just said, also, like, how you would integrate in your classroom, I, uh, I guess, in your lab, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let's talk about your CV. Um, here I thought about bringing an example, but I already told you my CV is terrible. Um, it has all of the components, but it doesn't look very good. So um, I, I'd like us to find examples of CVs, and we can talk a little bit about what I think would make my own CV look better. 
Uh, you have to go through your academic experience. That These are all things that should be um, headings. Uh, and then you should have, I think you should have bullets below that. Although Meg Urey just recently looked at my CV and she made me get rid of all the bullets. <laughs> I'm not sure why, I'm still not completely sure why. So we'll have to work on CV. Should list your honors and awards. Should list your research positions and your leadership positions. Teaching and outreach, which um, can go later, uh, or could be if you have a very long list and it looks too long compared to the other sections, you might have it on a web page somewhere and list the URL. Uh, service work on committees and things like this, if you've served on any committees, if you're running a seminar series, uh, things like that can go there. Publications can be long or short, it depends on your field. In colliders, your publication list may be huge. So it can be good to call out, say, top five publications or top three publications, things that you contributed to most, uh, and then the rest. Um, it can also include a section if you've been involved in writing a proposal or a white paper, that can be called out in a separate section. How much you call out the different sections depends a little bit on how much you have in each category. In general, if you only have one thing in a category, it shouldn't be its own category. You should group it into the broader category and change the title to include it. Um, if you've done 10 white papers and 10 proposals, they should be separate. If not, it should be the same category. That's my example. And conference proceedings, I think, should be called out, I think should be called out separately. Again, that's a little field dependent. In experimental particle physics, conference proceedings are a bit of a thing of the past. I don't pay any attention to them. I usually don't write them, frankly. But for theorists, they can be quite important. So if you're a theorist, it may be something that you want to include in papers, uh, or it may be something that you want to call out separately. And then there's also some conference proceedings which are reviewed. Like IEEE reviews their conference proceedings like they would a paper. So um, you might then have peer-reviewed publications and include them in that list even though it's a conference proceeding. So you have to sort, it can be a little complicated. And finally, talks. Again, if you have uh, many conferences and seminars, you can call them out separately. If not, make it one category. Conferences, workshops, and seminars. If you can call out something that's invited versus a contribution, uh, you should do so. If you only have one or two invited talks, include it in the list, but write in the list of that talk, maybe even bold it, invited presentation, because that makes a difference if it was specifically invited versus submitting an abstract to a conference, which is a contribution. Yes? So for invited talks, does it include like someone inviting someone from your experiment, for example, or yes. do you still include that as invited? Like for a seminar? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Seminars are invited talks. Right, but what about for a conference? Let's say someone invited someone from your experiment and then you're invited out. Oh, just go. So it depends. Okay. Um, that's a fine line. Uh, there's, I'd say there's three different categories for conferences. Mm -hmm. There's a call for abstracts and you submit it just like yeah. a con contribution. Uh, someone from a conference emails me as a microboon spokesperson mm -hmm. and says we need a speaker and we assign someone. That's mm -hmm. kind of a gray area. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say that's a contribution. Okay. And then clearly invited. Uh, someone from Microboon emails our talks committee and says, I was invited to give this talk. I'm going to go off and give it. That's okay. clearly invited. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the other thing is that there is, there's a difference between review talks and um, topic specific talks. And so review talks are also something that can be called out, if not in its own category, uh, as a description in the bullet <laughs> or not bullet. Um, of that specific presentation. Okay. Anything you want to add here? A few more things on CV. Okay, so let me talk about positions. This is important. There's a section that I listed here for research positions and leadership positions. So there's two different styles, uh, how people include these in their CV. Some people just list them, I was a cross-section convener. Other people say cross-section convener, and then they can have even a five or 10 line description of what that is. 
Um, and you can think of that just as a, a job description. I run meetings, I oversee analyses, I review papers, uh, and in this capacity, we've produced three PRLs, um, and you can, you know, in, a, in parentheses, list their citations very briefly. That's fine. It can be a great way for someone who wants to look at a CV and get a few more details about what a specific position was. But uh, I caution you not to be too redundant, which is what I said before. I personally get irritated if I see the same information in two different places and super irritated if the words are exactly the same. So you have to be a little careful about how you choose to do that. We'll move on in a minute and talk about general writing practices. So let me pause. Any other questions about these different components? Should you include papers you referee? Does that go into uh, service work? Uh, yes, you could put it in service work, or if it's um, a lot of papers, it could be its own category. Um, that's a good point. Um, or you can put it under, in service work, you can put referee for, and you can list the journal name. If you don't, sometimes referee information, usually, always, referee information for a specific paper is confidential or unnamed. So then you could just put the journal name and then you could put in parentheses how many papers you've reviewed, for example. Good question. Okay. Here we're almost to an hour. I was I told Supraja, I only have like 20 slides. How am I going to fill up an hour? <laughs> Okay, so um, overall, think about what the committee is looking for, provide concrete examples to show that you have these skills. And before you start writing, ask yourself, what do I want the distracted, busy reader to remember about me? Do you want to say some about some of this? Um, actually, I, I, you have to stand up for the camera. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think I will touch on this uh, when I get to the writing section, so I can just- Okay, we're, are we not? Here we are yes, in the writing here, section, yes. so stay standing. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to talk some, through some of these principles? Sure. Yeah, I can, um, should I ask if anyone has questions for Bonnie before? This is just two slides that I'll talk about writing. OK. Um, yeah, so last semester, I did teach a whole 90-minute workshop on this, but I've just condensed the, the big things into two slides. I'm happy to talk to people later or send materials along, if you would prefer. Uh, it's a bit wordy. Sorry about that. But I'll just go through these points. So this slide is about how you decide what to put in your statement or cover letter. Hope, um, I, I really liked the question you had, Marielle. It, it is a little bit of a balancing act. Something I find useful, even if it's a bit annoying, is uh, before you start writing to maybe take 15 minutes, half an hour, and really think about what the goal of writing your cover letter or research statement is. I mean, it might be really obvious, I want this job, is the goal. Uh, but really thinking through sort of your scientific interests, your values, why you're applying for this position, uh, and what you want them to remember about you. You could even do like a stream of consciousness just writing down for 15 minutes. I think it helps organize your thoughts a little bit. And if you can, I would suggest trying to condense this into one statement, which is sort of your thesis statement for your research statement. Like, I worked on this thing in neutrino physics, and I'm applying for this job because of blah, blah. That's that's the sentence. And then when you're writing and later when you're editing, I would suggest looking at each sentence and asking what functional role does this play with respect to the goal that I have, that one statement. I usually have it written out in front of me. I find this very useful. Uh, this way you can make sure that um, the thing is uh, a research statement or a cover letter is not a textbook. The, the goal of this is not to teach the committee member about neutrino physics or the Higgs boson or condensed matter theory or, or, or whatever it is, but rather to say what you did for that field and how it's relevant, if this makes sense, the difference between these two things. Uh, and Bonnie already suggested this, but um, yeah, you could consider asking multiple people with varied levels of experience and interest to look over your writing. It's this might be a bit uncomfortable, I guess, because you're putting your heart in the, in the page. Uh, but it, it really does help if you can ask them specific questions, like ask them which sentences, which paragraphs are unclear they see or boring to them, um, and what stands out, what they find interesting. 
and then you can restructure. It's a little bit of a trial and error process, I guess. Um, so in terms of, you know, having the balance between being technical versus highlighting sort of the broad impact, um, you will have multiple drafts of these things. And it does help to ask different people and um, ask if, they're, if you're getting your story across. Uh, I find second, third set of eyes to help. Um, Try to shift the focus onto your role in the story. I always like to ask, um, I mean, not to be discouraging, but to ask yourself, why should they care for every sentence? Um, so a really easy way to do this is, this sounds a bit strange, but actually the way someone reads a sentence, they tend to focus on the first part of the sentence more than the rest of it if they're skimming. This is also true for a paragraph. Most people read the first and the last sentence of a paragraph. So. If you're saying, if say you were the first author on a nature paper in 2017, I would start the sentence with, as first author in this paper, in this nature paper in 2017, rather than in 2017, comma, I wrote this paper. It's such a silly, small difference, but it, it actually does highlight your role and why that sentence is relevant to this statement. Uh, yeah, be concise and specific, as specific as you can. But there is a bit of a balance because you want to, again, avoid too much jargon. So if you have to use scientific jargon, take a sentence to explain it. Explain what that means and why that's relevant. Uh, and oh, Apani, do you want to say something? Yeah, this? just to say, uh, successful writers will tell you that they write a little every day. Uh, if you take 15 minutes over your first cup of coffee in the morning and write, that you know, and every day iterate or write a paragraph of your research statement or reread it and write it. Writing every day can really make you a better writer and therefore make your research statement and your teaching statement better as well. It might make it easier to that that feeling of coming to a blank page might it might get easier over time if you just practice it. Yes. Yeah. Let me switch. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit about the structure and grammar. This is not at all comprehensive. It's just a few points. Uh, Bonnie already said this, but I'm going to reiterate, mention your main goals early on. If you can, in the very first paragraph, I usually look for the main point or the thesis statement of a piece of writing as the last sentence of the first paragraph, last couple sentences. Uh, this is, again, for the distracted reader that's just trying to get the point uh, of your story. This kind of goes against setting up a scene and bringing out characters and having a narrative arc. So it goes against the rules of writing, say, a chapter or a book uh, or a beautiful essay. Uh, but I think this is more useful. How do you try to be efficient in telling them about yourself? Uh, avoid using passive voice. I think this is generally so that rather than saying something was done by me, say I did something. Uh, use action verbs. I have a list in the next slide. I won't go through them, but you can use this as a reference. Uh, and this is, try to have connecting phrases or sentences between topics. So it can feel a bit stilted if you just say, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and I did this. Uh, even small, this, this is very simple, but using words like however, furthermore, uh, or having you know some kind of um, bridge between different topics can be helpful. I, I actually recommend just reading your writing out loud and seeing if it flows well. This is more a technical point. Just uh, if you're using abbreviations, a lot of us do. Uh, you know, the names of experiments, the names of processes, things like this. Even if the person who's reading it is just a professor that's already in your field, uh, it's just good practice to provide full forms. And then, yeah, we already touched upon jargon. And here's a list of action verbs. So rather than saying, uh, I participated in, I joined, uh, I joined the effort in, you're also wasting some space to say join the effort in. You can be more concise by just saying, I developed, evaluated, whatever the actual thing that you did is. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, yeah, the idea is to be more efficient and not waste your verbs. Um, every verb that you use should be a, a good one. Uh, yeah, that, that's, this is all I have for now, but I'm also happy to talk more about this. I have more resources about writing in general uh, and communicating. Oh yeah, this is a, a good slide. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a link to the to the writing lab. The Office of Career Strategy also has some good materials about writing. We also I forgot to mention this, but we also do workshops on public speaking and presenting. Uh, so we do workshops on how to present engagingly. This is relevant for a job talk as well, right? Um, to present to a diverse audience of different experiences and uh, interests and things like this. 
And uh, to talk about uh, what you mentioned, Banu, um, the workshop I taught in the spring, we did do a peer review section where people were free to bring their own cover letters. And we had a list of guidelines for how you can be a good peer reviewer. So what you can look for and how you can give constructive feedback and people switched and people who didn't have their own we had some examples and then we went over them the examples that i have are from biology because there are a lot of biologists at mm -hmm. yale so which is why i didn't provide them today but we can try to collect them for physics it's nice to see examples yeah so yeah this is what i have and i'll add one thing about um getting other people to read your research statement if you're asking faculty even your advisor to read things give them time i need this in two weeks if you say to someone can you please read this it's due tomorrow that's hard because people are busy everyone's busy so give them time and if you're asking someone who maybe you wouldn't normally ask to do something and you feel like it's kind of a burden you can um first of all you should ask anyway Second of all, you can ask them exactly what you want help with. What I really need help with is how to write about data science in paragraph three. Uh, and that can be a way for someone to say contribute, uh, contribute and help you, but in a very pointed way. Mm -hmm. Any questions about writing or yeah, approaching the writing process? Okay, we're done. We can. You should give your feedback to Estella for any future workshops, or if there's something you didn't like and you don't want to tell me, tell her, and I'll make her <laughs> tell me. Like I said, this is the first time we focused just on a writing package. I hope it was worthwhile, but one can always do better. So that would be the goal for the future. Yeah, and if you are interested in some uh, more peer review kind of workshop, let me know too, so that we can organize. Yeah, thank you. Let's thank Bonnie's project.